Well, ladies and gentlemen, shall we begin? Just for the record, my name is Christopher Forsyth. For those of you who don't know me, I'm chairman of the Management Committee of African Studies uh, and also a lawyer, which explains my particular interest in, in this conference. Our keynote speaker on this occasion re requires relatively little introduction to this audience, but she's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in Anthropology and Africana Studies and a former chairperson of the Council on African Studies at Yale. And she works on religious nationalism, legal institutions, human rights, international law, and the interface between culture, power, and globalization, and its relationship to race and modernity. So that's an immensely broad canvas on which she's painted, but she's to address us this morning on bring back our girls hashtag international justice, sentimentality, and the politics of the unsayable. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're ready, Kamari Maxine Clark. Thank you. Very much. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Forsyth, for the, your introduction. It's uh, wonderful to be here and to have been invited to present the keynote for this Pursuing Justice in Africa conference, uh, as well as, of course, to share in the celebration, the 50th anniversary celebration um, for the Center for African Studies at Cambridge. So congratulations to you uh, for that. Let me also take this opportunity to thank Dr. George Caravavain and Dr. Jessica Johnson for the invitation to address you, of course. They've ushered me through, and I mean, probably a year ago now, I re received that email and held the time and made the commitment. So, and they took good care of me over the course of the, the, the last uh, period. So, of course, I appreciate that and thank you for that. Of, and as well, uh, Professor Harry Angland uh, for his support uh, through the Center for African Studies here at Cambridge. Um, let me also congratulate them for the success of this conference uh, thus far and, and for pursuing such uh, ambitious and important goals. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said about this topic at this particular historical juncture, so it's with pleasure that I engage with you on this topic. Um, colleagues, my, my talk for today is an attempt to think about what justice is in Africa in this moment uh, in which new forms of humanitarianism are being mobilized alongside the war on terror. In many ways, the themes um, addressed over the past two days highlight the importance of being vigilant and open to the contemporary complexities and ironies of justice in Africa and elsewhere. Um, my talk, of course, is entitled Bring Back Our Girls, hashtag international justice, sentimentality, and the, possible, and the politics of the unsayable. But let me just foresight, foregro foreground my central argument, which is um, the, the realization that we've entered into a period that I refer to as neo-justice. Um, and in many ways, it's, it's characterized as the, the form of mass mobilization that we've seen around um, justice work. Um, and, and what I'll present to you today has to do with two features that are part of its inherent contradictions. One um, is connected to a disassociation with the materiality of suffering. And some of what I'll talk about today will attempt to theorize that disassociation. And that, of course, is accompanied by uh, a sentimental resignification of the of ideas of suffering as a social wrong, which can be addressable through judicial solutions. So there is this, this idea that uh, justice equals the law, right? And so in many ways, the talk is about um, uh, legality and the challenges and limits of legality, as well as the ways that the, the presumption is that, that justice is, can be executable by consumer agents, uh, individuals, um, contemporary activists who are agents of change and, and make decisions and in a particular temporal context. And so I'll, I'll unravel that over the course of my talk. I'll, I'll start by, I'll read most of it for the sake of efficiency and um, talk through some parts of it. 
Last spring, the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag was mobilized and quickly popularized by politicians, concerned citizens, celebrities such as Kim Kardashian, Angela Jolie, and Whoopi Goldberg and Michelle Obama, the First Lady of the United States. The articulated goal was the return of the more than 300 Nigerian girls abducted from a school in Chibok, Nigeria, by Islamic militants in the Nigerian state of Borno, one of 12 states that instituted the strict ship cr criminal Sharia less than a decade ago. The support of the global network <coughs> interested in protecting those victimized by the abductions led to a transnational mass mobilization in which millions of dollars were committed by governments and citizens in a short period of time to communicate the demands for the return of the innocent girls to their families, to their dreams, that of post-secondary education. To briefly recap the events that led up to the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, on April 14, 2014, Boko Haram, a militant Islamic group based in northern Nigeria, went to Chibok to kidnap girls boarding at the local school. The girls boarded there overnight to take a national entrance exam to gain admission to post-secondary education. Boko Haram first attacked the village, then the military base. Then, its militants disguised themselves in official government uniforms, and at 8.45 that night, they attacked the boarding school by announcing that the girls that Boko Haram vigilantes were going to, by announcing to the girls that the Boko Haram vigilantes were going to attack the school, and that they were there to protect them. Okay, where was I here? All right. So this, tra this strategy led to Boko Haram abducting 330 girls, constituting a mix of Christians and Muslims, ranging from 15 to 18 years of age. A month prior to the abduction of the girls, the schools in the area had closed for fear of terror attacks by the Muslim rebels. But the boarding school in Shibak had reopened so that the girls could take their final exams. Witnesses say that the girls were aware of the risks of, seeing an, of seeking an education in an environment known to have denied that opportunity to girls. But they wanted to pursue their education to one day become doctors, lawyers, and teachers so, that they, so they took the chance of preparing for the national exam. However, Boko Haram is an Islamic militant group based in West Africa whose name means Western education is sinful or forbidden. The group has been suspected of causing a range of attacks throughout Nigeria and, of course, very recently in Cameroon and Chad uh, since 2009 with the goal of establishing an Islamic State. With approximately 6,000 fighters and the control of over 20,000 square kilometers of northeastern Nigeria, the group has now emerged as a major force and has pledged an allegiance to the Islamic State, also known as ISIS or ISIL. The militant group's leader, Abubakar Shekau, uh, claimed responsibility for the <coughs> girls' abduction, stating, and I quote, Western education should end. Girls, you should go and get married. Western education should fold up. I abducted your girls. I will sell them in the market by Allah. Related sources said that the abducted girls were taken into neighboring Chad and Cameroon and sold as brides to the Islamic militants for $12, 12 US dollars. The girls were described by the militant leaders as being held as sexual slaves in response to the kidnapping and potential sale of the girls into sexual slavery. The US Secretary of State, John Kerry, at a, spoke at a pon, pe, press conference in Addis Ababa where he declared that the US would support Nigeria's efforts to find the missing girls, stating, the kidnapping of hundreds of children by Boko Haram is an unconscionable crime, and we will do everything possible to support the Nigerian government to return these young girls to their homes and to hold per perpetrators responsible for justice. In this age of Twitter, this news was described as going viral through the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag. With millions of tweets, 
within a 24-hour period demanding the girls' release, the news coverage of the African girls denied an education by militant Muslims led to the collection of electronic signatures and millions of dollars in aid from leaders, celebrities, and average citizens from around the world. <laughs> Activists in over 30 global cities, uh, New York, Los Angeles, London, uh, Lagos, uh, rallied, engaged in rallies, demanding their, that their governments mobilize sufficient military support to arrest the perpetrators and return the girls. The messages were expressed succinctly and with great clarity. In, pro in pondering the movement's message in this, global, this age of global circulations, this talk will focus on two interrelated themes. First, how the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag built a social movement based on empathy that mobilized the compassion to protect African victims with exceedingly complex, within an exceedingly complex context in which Nigeria's president was publicly advocating retributive justice for those who kidnapped the girls while privately negotiating amnesty for Boko Haram militants. Second, how threats of criminal proceedings against individual perpetrators involved the ju judicialization of political issues that erased the way that Nigeria's northern Muslim communities came to understand their plight and replaced it with a victim fetish propelled by the judicial immediacy of the now. With its focus on pursuing the individual criminal responsibility of perpetrators of violence, the media image of the African victim to be saved was reduced to someone who suffered physical violence inscribed in the body. The structural forms of victimhood caused by conditions of economic or political marginalization were relegated to the shadows, and those at risk of the worst forms of structural violence were folded into a discourse by the legal responsibility to protect victims wherever they are in the world discourse. With young African girls at the center of a co coordinated assemblage or coordinated assemblages against sexual violence by those deemed terrorists, the media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, the various web networks catapulted the empathetic resolve to bring this issue to international attention. The tweets and hashtags needed only to invoke a few words assembled together, bring back our girls as a way to reference the cause of the violated female victim whose sympathies were seen and being felt globally. The invocation of the possessive hour highlighted the declaration of a shared community that the girls belong to us and that we have a responsibility to protect them against their captives. And the bring back imperative highlighted the militarized might behind the demand. Yet as a form of do-good activism in which one can send a text, donate a dollar, wear a wristband, or sponsor someone to run a mile in the service of victims, the repackaging uh, through the discourse of social movements highlights another set of discourses at play. These other discourses involve the individualization of criminal responsibility in which injustice is, indi is indi individualized and pursuable through legality. Together, the individualization of criminal responsibility for mass crimes exists in, a, in an assemblage of national, regional, and international law that when African states like Nigeria ratified the Rome Statute for the ICC in 2001, um, they submitted to the jurisdiction of that court. In this assemblage, judicial action is seen as the supreme producing mechanism for victims, so-called victims. And membership in the ICC treaty regime comes with the stated obligation that in situations of mass violence, the Nigerian government is expected to conduct genuine investigations to determine who bears the greatest responsibility for crimes, and that they, that is, the Nigerian government, will prosecute those found most responsible. Now, The ICC has been engaged in the wedding of national judicial solutions to mass violence with the expansion of international law um, in which the moral and judicial focus has moved from a focus on sovereignty, the sovereignty of states and state protections to the protection of individual persons, groups of people, and membership, of course, in a network of treaty obligations. With the discursive shift from state sovereignty to individuals and treaty commitments to humanity, the idea of the victim to be protected has emerged in, in international law as a key, a key modality of judicial action. 
This, ship was a this shift was accompanied by a new discourse based on a parallel humanitarian regime guided by the law of war that incorporated dimensions of democratization with political and social transformations that had the responsibility to protect victims as well as to end impunity by prosecuting perpetrators. Both figures, the perpetrator and the victim, had become central to the merger of this new, humanitarian, hum, new humanitarianism with fo foreign policy making and international law mechanisms at its core. The intertwined conjuncture of the perpetrators and the victims essential to the international justice project in many ways is being driven by a justice fetish of the now and backed by a military industrial complex armed with a responsibility to protect. The temporality of the now is spectacularized through legal rituals, and I, of course, write about this in some of my earlier work, and military action associated with the global war on terror deemed necessary solutions to the failure of the, deemed necessary because of the failure of the rebels to comply. Now, I'm interested here for this talk in the immediacy of the declaration, Bring Back Our Girls, and its mobilization as a universalist rallying cry uh, by declaring our legal responsibility to act, to defend, to threaten military action as key components of international justice. This call for international justice provides the, the discursive mechanisms through which contemporary meetings of justice are conflated with legality, as I started with. The effect of this is a new form of justice in the 21st century that negates the relevance of inequality embedded in much deeper histories of violence and instead focuses on justice as achievable through our solidarity in pursuing perpetrators through legality. The interrelationships between our solidarity with the idea of defending the vulnerable and our agency demands immediacy, in which there is a demand for immediacy through trials to, produce a to pursue adjudication for those deemed criminally responsible, this is fundamentally what I'm calling neo-justice. For what I mean, the emotive humanitarian solidarity of judicial accountability that displaces ongoing structural and historical violence. The emergence of this formation has not only consequences for how women and girls from the Islamic North have come to be depicted nationally and internationally, but it also tells us something about pro-judicial activism and its recuperation of political rights for the individual as the basis of its militancy. I will argue that while these forms of good do-good activisms have resulted in what some scholars celebrate as the globalization of justice norms as demands for international tribunals for those deemed uh, most criminally responsible, these activisms actually contribute to the conditions for neo-justice. A range of international relations scholars have begun to theorize the central place of judicial trials in uh, new justice norms of the 21st century. In describing these formations of, as emblematic of the new justice norms, they insist that these formations will eventually constrain behavior through the acceptance of wrongdoing by which people internalize new norms. However, as I'll show, this approach to international justice through norm internalization is only part of the story. The other part of the story concerns the dual place of the do-good actor in, in post-justice strategies and the positioning of adjudication as the only alternative to violence. This talk then is concerned with what is rendered invisible through this particular vision of justice and what recedes to the margins all in relation to what constitutes the political in an increasingly judicial world. And of course here, by the political and the judicial, I'm not meaning to separate them. They're clearly mutually, exclu mutually exclusive. But in many ways, I'm referring to the, the multiple politicalities that exist within legal domains alongside that which we understand as traditionally political. Now today, almost a, a year from the day of the attack, uh, in Chibok, 219 of the girls abducted by Boko Haram are still missing, and Boko Haram continues to attack innocent victims. The intervention effort that the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag was meant to inspire seems to not only have faded from social media memory, but to also have failed. The inability of the Nigerian government to save the girls and transfer 
and to transfer them and transfer the rebels to the ICC uh, to pursue prosecutorial power has led to ongoing attacks resulting since then in over 2,000 dead. Now, what are we to make of this? The attack of the Chibok girls, of course, is, is part of a larger global backlash of extremists who are against girls' education, from the Pakistan Taliban shooting of 15-year-old Malala Yousafi uh, because she advocated for girls' education, to the throwing of acid in the faces of girls walking to school in Afghanistan, to Nigerian militants destroying 50 northern Nigerian schools. The Boko Haram attacks on the girls of Chibok is certainly steeped in an ideological rejection of Western notions of gendered freedoms. But more importantly, the unequal development between the Muslim North and the Christian South has been manifest in the uh, in unequal development, or we might otherwise talk about inequalities, over the past century, leading to the rebels' quest to create an Islamic state in the northern Nigeria region, as well as to reclaim um, some of the regions in the accompanying states. As argued in 2010 before the U.S. Senate Committee by Hawa Ibrahim, a quite well-known um, human rights, uh, Nigerian human rights lawyer, who um, in the earlier period defended uh, Safia and um, Saf Safia, uh, Amina Luwal and Safia Bendali, um, uh, probably about 10 years ago, around the, the mobilization to save them from being stoned to death for um, um, sexual, what was seen as sexual promiscuity. And, and so this is uh, how uh, I paraphrase Hawa's um, declaration before the U.S. Senate, where she um, explains the Nigeria South has benefited from local resources, infrastructure, and the development of graded public roles for children. And while challenges persist, the majority of girls receive a primary school education that they are, try that they are able to try to broker for em employment opportunities. Mainstream economic and political opportunities for girls in the North are minimal, she says. She continues, the girls are often expected to marry young and depend on their husbands for sustenance. The North lacks the type of public resources and economic resources, e infrastructure and institutions enjoyed by the South. Now, part of the story, at end quote, part of the story communicated is that these structural differences are historically embedded, of course, and that they lay the foundations for ongoing underdevelopment, unemployment, and social unrest, uh, through which a constellation of actors fight the encroachment of Western knowledge, politics, religious, uh, and social order with the explicit violence on female bodies. And although the girls who were abducted represent a particular violation to be protected, the, the reality is that the macro issues, uh, the erasure of inequality, can barely be rectified through empathy or the juridical solution. Yet we've entered a new era in which international justice assemblages have taken on new capacities and responsibilities focused on these judicial solutions, and especially in the global south. And for any of you who have, over the last 12, 13 years, followed the ICC cases, you'll certainly know that all of the cases have been in Africa and, and that all of the victims have been African, classified as victims and the perpetrators, um, certainly African leaders and rebel groups, etc. Um, the justice formation then that I'm discussing today is concerned with why the Save Our Girls hashtag uh, campaign and its humanitarian logic was so compelling to its audiences and what it tells us about justice in the second decade of the 21st century. Okay, so I'll skip to the next section. Now, this, this adage, we ask for justice, you give us law, in many ways characterizes um, much of the work that, that I'm doing, in, in certainly in this period, and that um, has emerged from a significant amount of my own research, which is, and this again returns to the slippage between <coughs> justice and law, and the presumption that justice equals law, that is increasingly characteristic of, of this moment. Um, so in her book, um, The Justice Cascades, political scientist Catherine Sickink argues that the enactment of international foreign and domestic judicial prosecutions across the globe constitutes a new trend in world politics, holding state officials criminally responsible for human rights violations. These judicial prosecutions, she argues, reflect what she calls justice cascades, the shift in the norm of criminal accountability coming into greater prominence. 
from the Nuremberg tribunals to the Tokyo tribunals to the prosecutions of Pinochet and Milosevic through various ad hoc tribunals, she insists that these ideas have spread and concretized a popular new norm toward individual accountability. As she argues, quote, norms are intersubjective, that is, they are held by groups of people, but norms start as ideas, she continues, held by a handful of individuals. These individuals try to turn their favorite ideas into norms, which is why we call them norm entrepreneurs. But these norm entrepreneurs, she continues, succeed. But when these norm entrepreneurs succeed, norms spread rapidly, leading to norms cascades." End of quote. Building on Mal Malcolm Gladwell's notions of cascades with tipping points, Sasink argues that one of the subsets of the cascade phenomenon involves the articulation of internalized norms. Through an examination of new judicial prosecution, she shows that justice has come to be popularized as legal accountability for crimes. Today, both heads of state and rebel leaders alike can be pursued for crimes against humanity, she says. To this end, the immunity uh, ethos as a new international social value has been reasserted uh, through the end to impunity of justice that has taken root in the human rights revolution. Now, Sasink's model of, of judicial accountability as a new justice norm, in, in many ways, and in, in, I suppose my point of departure here is that this, this um, model for judicial accountability fails to take into account the way that international justice actually works as uh, a judicial strategy alongside prevailing moral discourses to protect mass, mass <coughs> victims, uh, victims of mass violence. Instead, for succinct, uh, justice cascades happen through people's acceptance of global standards and the expansion of human and civil rights litigation in courts around the world. And, and while attempts for the expansion and spread of prosecutions are explained through the role of uh, sociality and the establishment of new norms, the reality is that norms are not only established through interna internalization processes as negative acts. Social norms are not simply shape, shaped by their social functions. They're also influenced by affective responses, that is, sentimentalized empathy, individual behavior, and do-good market strategies that actively craft the citizen consumer with choices to act. Rather than pursuing then presuming that social norms cascade and provide signaling mechanisms for negative acts that are internalized and shape values around justice, I'll now move on to show how these justice values are manifest in the desire to be proactive and act in ways that animate feeling, thereby producing senses of, an, of accountability that actually stand in for justice. To miss the way that empathy works alongside contemporary calls for accountability, is to dis discount the continuing relevance of the way that the responsibility to protect discourses work through humanitarian aesthetics and justifications for war, including the war on terror. Through mobilizing sentimental campaigns that connect the recovery of the Chibok girls with judicial punishment for their captives, ca captors, the, S the Southern-based NGOs in Nigeria responsible for spearheading the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag campaign alongside their US and European partners articulated their moral commitments to as rights for all girls. The figure to be saved was constructed through the temporally urgent uh, sentimental message that reflect our values, our educational rights, um, according to the movement that is, while also tacitly backing interventions necessary for grounding these uh, sentimental commitments. And of course the interventions are military interventions necessary. Okay, so uh, just a, a couple of case studies then. First, to the ICC. Um, it is presumed today that to utter the words, victims want justice, is to assume that victims want trials to address their grievances. The, this narrative construction of justice as law invokes the mission of protecting victims against powerful perpetrators through adjudicatory mechanisms. The International Criminal Court's legal mission presumes that in order to protect victims, justice must be understood as the objective manifestation of law. 
for Fatou Ben Souda, the lead prosecutor for the ICC, the, the violence of victimhood must not be open for negotiation. And her role is to, <coughs> is to pursue justice through the ICC. As she said, I cannot and will not forget the innocent victims, the innocent Kenyans who are no longer alive to tell their story. I will not forget those who did live to tell their stories of survival and who have waited too long for justice. These survivors are crying out for more justice, not less. I will continue to fight for the justice they deserve. Now, the, the language that we see here um, by Ben Suta, as well as the earlier references to John Kerry's invocations of uh, judicial um, imperatives and the Nigerian government's use of these statements to intervene to save the victims uh, reflects the workings of what I've re referred to elsewhere as legal encapsulation. In this case, the narrative construction that equates justice with the law invokes the mission of protecting victims against powerful perpetrators who have enjoyed impunity for too long. The sentimental legalism tells a celebratory story of the rule of law operating through objectivity, predictability, and empowerment to end impunity, measures that have the potential to end violence, we're told. These discourses have proliferated through a global imaginary in which a vociferous human rights sentimentality has taken shape. Invocations of the African vi perpetrator and the savable victim have produced and perpetrated the narrow presumption that justice can be achieved through legal or military adjudication. Among many pro-ICC lawyers and NGO activists, only that which is intelligible to positive law can be seen as justice. As such, this form of legal encapsulation constructs a dominant narrative about what justice is through the erasure of other visions of justice. Let's turn now to Michelle Obama's involvement in the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag in which she took over President Obama's weekly radio address on Mother's Day to promote the girls' cause. Here, the Mother's Day address began with a sentimental condolence to the families that lost their girls uh, to the kidnapping by Boko Haram. And she said, and I quote, she begins the, in a solemn, quite solemn um, posture, uh, the millions of people across the globe, like millions of people across the globe, my husband and I are outraged and heartbroken over the kidnapping of more than 200 Nigerian girls from their school dormitory in the middle of the night. This unconscionable act was committed by a terrorist group determined to keep these girls from getting an education, grown men attempting to snuff out the aspirations of young, young girls. Upon articulating the prohibition of education as unconscionable, she then continued by reassuring the world of the president's resolve to intervene. And I quote, I want you to know that Barack, so not President Obama, Barack, so this is the, the intimacy, of course, that's, that's part of her commitment, that Barack has directed our government to do everything possible to support the Nigerian government's efforts to find these girls and bring them home. As an act of empathy and a complex form of both racial and universal solidarity, she likened, she likened uh, these, the girls to her girls, uh, to the daughter of any human. And I continue, in these girls, Barack and I see our own daughters. We see their hopes, their dreams, and we can Im only imagine the anguish their parents are feeling right now. Many of them have been hesitant to send their daughters off to school, fearing that harm might come their way. But they took the risk because they believed in their daughter's promise and wanted to give them every opportunity to succeed. As a call to action, she ended her address emphasizing themes of resilience, bravery, and hope. And, and she, she continues, right now more than 65 million girls worldwide are not in school. Yet, we know that girls who are educated make higher wages, lead healthier lives, and have healthier families. And when more girls attend secondary schools, that this boasts their country's entire economy. So education is truly a girl's best chance for a bright future, not just for herself, but for her family and her nation. These girls embody the best hope for the future of our world, and we are committed to standing up for them, not just in times of tragedy and crisis, but for the long haul. 
The humanitarian message sentimentalized through a mother's pain here tells us how critical it is for any child to develop a particular cultural competence in Western education in order to engage in social mobility in a capitalist democracy contingent on social connections and market competition. This education then reflects the liberalist dreams of objectivity, of fairness, we're told, and diversity of approaches in ways that emphasize agency, autonomy, and individual power. What we see in this message, though, is the erasure of the particularities of the education that is on offer and deemed a girl's birthright. This articulation is actually a story about the, West, the pursuit of a Western education constructed as universal. But what it erases are the particularities of other knowledge forms and their embedded inequalities. For example, the idea that the girls represent the best hope for the future of our world is actually incongruent with those of the Obama girls in which the possibility for realizing hopes and dreams are so radically different. However, these distinctions are unsayable as they also involve silences about the stereotypes of the Nigerian North as backward, as irrational, and validate tropes such as Muslim girls to be saved or girls to be brought to the West and made viable through the invocation of justice. Once Michelle Obama posted a photo of herself holding a sign, bring back our girls, on her Twitter account, a range of other celebrities rallied around this social media moment, from Angelina Jolie to Maya Farrell, Alicia Keys, Ellen, and more. Let's turn to um, an example of Angelina Jolie, who in many ways has become an uh, ambassador for the ICC, certainly, as well as humanitarian causes. And her response when interviewed was, the important thing, though, is to understand that this happens because these men think that they can get away with this and they can do this. We have to start arresting people for this. We have to start bringing them to justice. We have to start making it, making it an absolute crime that puts fear in these men so that they can think twice about this kind of action. Now, if we also scan the, the tremendous amounts of um, Twitter messages that, that uh, circulated, they, they're very much, many of them are very much in keeping with the Jolie sentiment. And again, this points to um, bringing people to justice, making them fair judicial consequences. Um, but an, another component that was particularly um, striking from the celebrity uh, Twitter invocations around uh, the, the necessary in, uh, solutions uh, was the idea that this has to end now. It was the immediacy of the intervention. So if you look at uh, the fourth from the top, the third from the, the top, Jessica Beale's statement, this is barbaric. Human trafficking needs to end now. Um, uh, th that many of the, the responses, of course, sending prayers for those missing daughters, let's bring awareness. So there's an awareness um, uh, invocation that's there, but uh, Rashida Jones, bring back our girls now. Um, Kim Kardashian, heartbreaking, let's ra wear, raise awareness. Um, if you go down to Stacey Dash at the bottom, uh, why the hell does it take three weeks and a trendy hashtag to get world leaders to care about 300 uh, kidnapped girls? So themes of outrage, tragedy, demands for immediate attention, often in the forms of arrests, pervade in these Twitter messages. But if we see these contemporary, these contemporary justice for victim discourses as producing fetishes in a Marxian sense, where a fetish is an object that people are fascinated by, but that keeps them from seeing other relations. Then the issue articulated as simply girls, or our girls to be saved, can be seen as fetishes of justice that stand in for other erasures. And if we reflect on the poster art that today stands in, in for the cause, that is the red image in the large block language, the hashtag and its popularity, the petition as a representation of dem democratic will or democratic participation, then we can see how the materiality of the fetish of the victim has changed in the contemporary uh, period. And I'll just um, compare that to some of the more familiar images from, this one is from an um, Oxfam web, website, but an image that was quite familiar in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s. Um, so compared to the image today, um, 
What the image of the suffering African poster child or the poster girl, in many ways it has turned to a new aesthetics, a red symbolism in the name of fairness, which articulates a new relationship between the signifier and the signified. For in these new international justice formations, associated with, associations with the helpless is subverted. So just to remind us of this association and that association. The material representation of the suffering is no longer necessary in order to compel sympathy. No longer does justice depend on our association with suffering and our acts of pity, thus guilt. Today, the rise of neo-justice can be seen by our agency to demand the immediacy of solutions and to create solidarities with the idea of suffering, the idea of our children, and for example, Michelle Obama's acceptance that the kidnapped girls could be her girls, could be our girls. This, this represents, these all represent this shift. What is overturned in the materiality of the suffering African child or the girl to be saved is that we get, what we get is the repackaging of humanitarianism through the agency of an activist consumer, making choices about <coughs> principles they can rally around. These principles in many ways are made recognizable through words, block arts, hashtags. The aesthetic repackaging of suffering produces it as a condition to be overcome through click, what some scholars refer to as clicktivism. So that is the technological tools of the capitalist order in which one can go, in go online as an agent of change and make the decision to support a cause. This modality of humanitarian aid works through the temporality of the now, the imperative um, what Sarah Kendall in many ways I think convincingly referred to as the imperative to make those demands not simply in the name of democracy but also through the backing of a military industrial complex in which the responsibility to protect those victimized by violence has become a legal responsibility of the state and actionable through its citizens. Yet the tragic reality of neo-justice is that deep inequalities that produce suffering not only remains unaffected, but are also erased and rendered sayable, unsayable. And when our lens for justice is the alleviation of an emergency or the pursuit of arrest or trial, trial then justice is only possible as that thing and the structural persistence of inequality can continue to exist even if the object is saved. With sentiments of empathy, the discourse then becomes one of rights and freedoms and the rescue, in this case, of the girl's future. Without the condi considering the conditions of structural inequalities, unemployment, political violence, many of these themes that we've, we've talked about over the course of the day, the last day and a half, that motivated protests in the first place. Now here I'm not, as I start, start to wrap up, I'm not justifying, and I, let me say it clearly, that uh, in no way am I justifying Boko Haram's violence. Um, I'm suggesting that these erasures, of the, um, these erasures have the effect of disconnecting the plight of the girls from other histories of struggle and instead uh, undermining those politics that call for the liberal dream of equality and education for all. Boko Haram's violence is not unrelated to the historical struggles between the predominantly Nigerian North and the Christian South. The spread of Islam predominantly in the North but later in the southwestern regions, be, region of, of today's Nigeria began a millennium ago. The creation of the Sokoto of Caliphate and the Holy War of 1804 to 1808 brought most of the northern region and adjacent parts of Niger and Cameroon under a single Islamic government. This extension of Islam with the er with the, within the area that's presently today known as Nigeria, of course, dates to the 19th century and resulted in the consolidation of the caliphate. During this period, the steady trade of slaves across the Saharan Desert and, the, um, and, and across, of course, the Atlantic Ocean accounted for tremendous internal fragmentation. Between 1950 and 1860, a steady stream of slaves held by the Caliphate of Sokoto in the north, uh, as well as among the Igbo and the Yoruba in the east and the, the, the west, resulted in the creation and susten sustenance of ethnic empires in these regions with slave raiding, ethnic and religious distinctions uh, became more pronounced, 
and a form of protection against being sold based on identifiably different associations. Out of a group of 250 to 400 ethnic groups and languages, three dominant ethnic groups prevailed, the Hausa in the north, the Yoruba in the west, and the Igbo in the east. And this, of course, emerged, um, out of this emerged violent struggles producing three regionally dominant groups. Conversion to Islam spread, conversion to a, uh, Christianity certainly spread, and were intricately associated with slavery and efforts to promote political and cultural autonomy through the reinforcement of ethnic and class hierarchies, as well as the emergence of various forms of gender dominance. Um, the relevance of the British is not incidental, of course. The, the, a product of British conquest in 1903, the consolidation of the northern, southern, um, the Western uh, territories into the colony and the protectorate of Nigeria led to the eventual uh, amalgamation by the British of the, the three regions in 1914. As a colony of British rule, the new Nigeria was reconstituted through the goal of resource extraction. European development led to the creation of new territorial boundaries and the implementation of roads, laws, uh, and new forms of political order that reinforced British colonial interests. Uh, those in the south and the east with closer proximity to the extractable resources certainly developed greater intimacies with, with British rule and benefited from, and benefited in, in quotes of course, from the ideologies of Western order or capitalist order. Um, and even though the British colonial period lasted uh, um, up to 60 years, um, it certainly contributed to ra rapid change in the contemporary period, ranging from extraction economies and it, their expansion, the expansion of agricultural products, consumption. I mean, we know the, 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 the proliferation, shaping moral orders, um, the development of educational formats and standardization forms, um, all uh, in, in many ways leading to a particular type of, of economic growth. And, um, and of course, with independence uh, in 1960, colonial rule created extreme forms of inequality coupled with the creation of a cash economy and its corresponding development infrastructure. We saw the development of religious categories and alliances um, certain silences around the formation of the secular state that was that was fundamentally Protestant in, in its ethos, but that um, paraded in its absence, in the absence, a presumption of the absence of an, a religious uh, logic. Um, and so, in many ways, I, I um, the I map this out. In, 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 I'm speaking to the converted in many ways among Africanists and those interested in interrogating justice. Um, but these are part of the, the underlying conditions of the possible for the contemporary challenge around the Chibok girls. As a post-colonial state, Nigeria is thus the creation of an invention of the modern era, whose roots reflect histories of violence, difference as well as unequal disparity between the North and the South, men and women, girls and boys. Um, the result has been the persistent construction of a people of the northern Nigeria region as ideologically backward, especially in relation to its relationship to girls and boys, or women and girls. Viewing the kidnapping of the Chibok girls and the related violence inflicted by Boko Haram in this context of the differences between southern and northern parts of Nigeria and Boko Haram's edict about Western education in many ways allows us to understand the present absence of politics and judicial and humanitarian uh, language. Uh, a range of scholars have written about the way that these tropes concerning the rejection of Western education has been articulated through discourses of civility or backwardness. These discourses made their mark in the early formation of the Nigerian nation uh, through, er, through some of the early missionary writing and colonial arguments about the native savage. And their effects continue to circulate in the public sphere via electronic technologies, videos, talk shows, nightly news captions, Senate congressional hearings, and through justice utterances that are further concretized in a world deemed secular and without religious bias. These forms of mediation rely not only on intermediaries, though, who articulate and internalize new signs and symbols, but also through codes and perceptions that shape the meanings that are invoked through, be through brief, empathetic Twitter utterances. 
The post-colonial struggles that unfolded in Nigeria following independence did not simply reflect a problem of radical Islam violence begetting more violence, as one would think in relation to Boko Haram <coughs> mobilization. The discovery and extraction of natural resources like oil, diamonds, and gas has compounded situations of armed conflict across the African continent. Following the discovery of oil and the related civ brutal civil war in Nigeria was plagued with military coups between the North and South to control economic power at the center of the Federation. The country experienced 10 successive military coups beginning in 1966, just years after independence, and immediately following this discovery of its oil reserves. The struggle to control Nigeria's government has always been in large part a struggle to control its resources. But mineral attention was given to, given to developing state institutions and equalizing them in relation to the North and the South. Instead, a highly centralized body with very little accountability formed in its place. This is a pattern repeated on the continent. So it's not surprising that the race for political control in many African countries has, le has led to extreme forms of violence, military coups, or rebels, uh, rebel groups vying for political influence to control various extraction industries. The ultimate erosion of state capacities to build viable economies for the citizens to command and regulate access to resources into a domestic economy and to build innovative mechanisms capable of in incorporating indigenous cultural traditions to direct future action all represent a more tragic set of realities that mask the actual violence of inequality. These post-colonial realities call into question the modes of liability for violence and question how justice might look if we overlook its fetishes and instead interrogate the strategic modes of mobilization for victims against perpetrators that invigorate affective strategies in pursuit of justice. By making the political invisible and rendering it outside of the law and not constitutive of it, the processes of encapsulating justice with legality make structural inequality in, in unintelligible. And as a result, the conditions that produce the needs for legality, such as structural inequality, systems of colonialism, imperialism, racism, are pushed to the margins and erased quite often in these invocations. This disappearing of politics has made the, the responses by Boko Haram's leaders misplaced or even inconceivable. My final point then turns to the dearth of scholarly work on how international justice works through the production of empathy for victims and the erasure of deeper structures of inequality. I end now then by showing how sentiments of empathy invoked in international humanitarian trajectories can help us to make sense of the emergencies of internal tensions, of the emergence of internal tensions between rights in a judicial sense and structures of feeling that reflect the ethical obligations that we may hold for each other. And uh, this last um, closing section turns on R2P, the responsibility to protect. So there, there are many genealogies, of course, for mapping the emergence of senses of obligations to others in international global trajectories. Uh, the contemporary popularization of a moral and political norm promoting protection of life regardless of state citizenship um, discourse emerged legally after 2001 with the establishment of the notion of the responsibility to protect, otherwise referred to we know as R2P. Um, now, the, the foundational pillars of R2P um, involve the idea that a state has a responsibility to protect its population from gross human rights violations. And of course, these include crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, <coughs> and ethnic cleansing. But the second component involves the assumption that the international community has a responsibility to assist in fulfilling that primary responsibility to its population. And then as we know, finally, if a state fails to protect its citizens from the four crimes of concern, and if it fails to maintain peaceful measures, the international community uh, has a responsibility to assist states in fulfilling that primary responsibility. Now, in, in many ways, these examples, and I turn very quickly to R2P, to show us that 
the way that the historical emergence of the concept produced real effects uh, post-2001 that shaped international practice around the defense of the victim and our moral responsibility to protect them. This moral responsibility is, is I don't think we would, ar I, there would be much contestation around the extent to which it's affective and propelled through the invocation of empathy uh, engineered to invoke engagement from social movement workers and the general public ready to exercise their agency and by pledging solidarity. Uh, the, the R2P discourse, however, is not only a moral architecture of the contemporary period. The notion of the obligation to protect the victim was driven by a force of law deployed across sovereign borders uh, uh, with expanded jurisdictional reach. The expansion of activity reflected a fundamental shift from the regulated affairs of the state to the expansion of global governance mechanisms known to operate from the north to the south, particularly in Africa and, and Latin America. And these regions reflect a continuity of economic dependencies, hence the need to manage political compliance with legal protections. Um, the, so this, this idea of the notion of the individual to, protect, to be protected then, part of what I'm saying here is, to, is that it's important that we make sense of the ethos as it, as it um, developed as a moral ethos, but we think about the relationship between northern and southern interests and the, um, the way that that ethos took shape alongside other transformative interests and formations. Now, despite the perversiveness of discourses about those victimized by violence and invoked by lawyers and presidents and their wives, celebrities and social movement activists, there exists a uh, significant absence in the use of victimhood as an analytic through which to explore the production of international judicial power. And the inability, and part of my, the issues that I'm taking with Sikink and others who are articulating this new justice norm simply in terms of norms that are internalized uh, that point to trials as the social consensus um, is that it, it fails to take into account the way that justice, uh, the, the, the conceptual questions um, around the production of justice and the particularities and the political uh, formations that are part of, of it. Um, by focusing scholarly analysis on legal justice as the basis for theorizing the emergence of new human rights principles and social norms, we're missing, of course, the way that these, notion, these norms actually worked. So in this case, the Chibok girls, the reality that the conception of African girls to be saved um, uh, or Muslim political extremists to be adjudicated did not emerge simply through a tipping point or cascading process by which particular norms are internalized. They emerged, as I'm arguing here, through the production of an idea of an individual to be protected through the mobilization of empathy, revenge, anger, and inequality of girls denied in education and injustices related to it. But these sentiments work not just through tipping points, of course, but through practices. They actually work through the power of erasure in which Western modes of perceiving justice are increasingly becoming judicialized, but not without necessary elisions of which, uh, which, don't which fit the liberal notion of progress, equality, and fairness. Um, the failure to recognize that these processes at play can lead to the non-recognition of the workings of power and a focus on the fetish and not the conditions of its making is part of the, the, the challenge today. Contemporary neo-justice can be seen as working through the victim fetish that operates through a profound form of discursive sentimentality. So to end then, as we enter the second decade of the 21st century, the plight of the victim in post-violence conflict situations is increasing, increasingly becoming embedded in retributive justice <coughs> approaches, such, certainly such as criminal tribunals. The Bring Back Our Girls hashtag mobilization campaign gained its strength, as I've shown, through the victim to be pr uh, protected discourse as the grounds for the political. And as I've shown, the life to be saved and the movement's mobilization was the life threatened by extraordinary catastrophe, in this case the abduction and sexual slavery as mass violence against uh, the human person or the body. This prioritization of innocence as warranting humanitarian and judicial intervention tells us an important story about the way that deeper forms of inequality are rendered invisible. 
by, de by depicting a notion of justice for the girls that is made legible through a depiction of a victim to be saved, to be returned, to be returned to us. The global community, the bring back our girls hashtag, was a call to return the Chibok girls to their families, and in doing so, to connect them to what was perceived as a better world, a world where their dreams could be protected through the educational pursuit. It involved the empathetic invocation of our girls through, through which justice was possible. But that justice, with its inability to address inequality, was driven by specters, a dual presence and absence in the form of a victim fetish, and continues to be as part of the argument. It's a story about the erasure of difference and the conditions for violence, including the unequal control over institutions, resources, and the moral and cultural re um, universes that permeate daily life. For while it is true that the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag mobilization came to be understood through the pursuit of perpetrators, it was the return of the victim imperative that was key to its sentimental power. Yet the call to protect the victim involved leaving intact the very hierarchies of power that gave legitimacy to the contemporary post-colonial state. And this was possible because of the history of things like the, the, the institutional foundations of RTP, as well as the histories of post-colonial inequality. What we're seeing, therefore, is the manifestation of this new form of neo-justice of our time. It reflects the encapsulation of law as non-political through increasing jurification of the public right. But that which constitutes the right is not always based on equality. The individual victim, in turn, was reduced to someone who suffered physical violence against their individual body, not structural forms of victimhood caused by the very conditions of economic and political disfranchisement at the heart of, new of the new justice discourse. The persistence of inequality in justice strategies has led to a pushback that takes many forms describing the fetish character of justice dislocated from ideological foundations of its meaning. This dislocation is being redefined through a new process taking shape in, in the post 9-11, post African structural adjustment moment that's leading to a pushback by unemployed youth, rebel groups reacting to structural inequality, various forms of corruption, while governments are cutting back on public goods, including education, social welfare, and public transportation. The effect is not inconsequential. Instead, social, inequali social equality goes underground and the violence sustained by Boko Haram's so-called victims or the, the girls victimized by Boko Haram becomes the focus. It becomes the fetish. And this is my argument. The narrowing of justice through legality has evacuated politics or uh, particular forms of politics and has enabled new signifiers that in their discursive forms not only invoke the protection of victims but make viable judicial or military action as the only appropriate solution to violence. By reconceptualizing international justice through a broadening of victimhood and analytically reclaiming its materiality through political solutions, we can move critical justice theory to a place where the conditions of inequality become the basis for theoretical engagement and not the fetish or the fiction of justice. The portability and temporal rapidity of the spread of contemporary digital technologies today give rise to this pro proclivity and in many ways require that we remain vigilant analytically in our analysis of the global condition. Thank you.